Okay, guys, Lance Martin, Cobalt Banker, our 2022 real estate market forecast continues. You are about ready to see our Christopher Thornburg presentation with Beacon Economics and UCR School of Economic Development. We're going to run the entire thing. A couple of things. We did not have time to do a post interview with Chris. So I want, and I have a bunch of questions. I just watch it. I have just tons and tons of questions. He's gonna come back in studio. We're gonna do a sit down interview. So what, this is my thing, watch the entire video. He's gonna say a couple things in the beginning or the middle and then even at the end. And it, I do think it's critical to get a full flavor, watch the entire video. If you watch the first 10 minutes, you may leave with a different impression than he's trying to, um, trying to send. So here he is, Dr. Christopher Thornburg, Beacon Economics, UCR School of Economic Development. Here he comes. Hello, everybody. This is Chris Thornburg with the uh, UC Riverside Center for Economic Forecasting and Development. I am, of course, the director, and it is wonderful to be back with Lance Martin and the entire crew of Coldwell Banker to give you the update on the economy, what's happening in the globe, the country, the state, right here, of course, in the heart of the Inland Empire, and most of all, what's happening in real estate. And um, look, I'm just going to jump right in. Got a lot to talk about, not a lot of time. I want to go back in the past two years ago. Go back to March, April 2020. Um, that, of course, was the really beginning of the pandemic and uh, the fear of the unknown, if you will. Um, we all remember, of course, the crazy times. There was no vaccine. We weren't sure how dangerous this thing was. We weren't sure how widespread it was. All sorts of emergency health, public health decrees went into place. And we were subjected, of course, to the U versus V debate. Now, U versus V debate, uh, if you remember, the V, of course, the folks like ourselves who said relatively rapid bounce back. The U camp, most of the folks out there saying this was going to be long and ugly. And here's some of those headlines you got to see back then. Coronavirus to cause the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. 30 to 40 million people could be evicted from their homes. 30% of Americans with home loans will stop paying if the U.S. economy remains closed through summer of 2020. Home prices are going to rose in June, but they'll fall in 2021. One of my favorite, make no mistake, the pandemic is morphed into a depression-like crisis. The UCLA forecast, oh, wow. I, I mean, unbelievable what we were subject to. Now, I appreciate the fear of the unknown, but this, of course, was kind of ridiculous. Let, let me talk about the U versus V debate in just a few bullet points. Um, from two years ago, today, right now, real consumer spending growth, real now, that's inflation adjusted, two years up 4.5%. Spending on goods is up 16% from where it was two years ago, which is why Lance is still trying to buy that boat. Uh, of course, you have disposable personal income up 13% from where it was two years ago pre-pandemic. Corporate profits, by the way, are up 20%. Proprietor incomes are up 16%. The unemployment rate currently sits at 3.6%. By the way, 3.6% with 11.2 million job openings in the United States, up from 7 million three years ago. Home prices are up 20% year over year incredibly tight inventories. In fact, overall, households have picked up a cool $30 trillion of household net worth. We'll come back to that statistic in a couple of minutes. Industrial production's up 3%. Inventory to sales ratios still at record low. You go through the statistics, and this is, of course, an economy that's absolutely on fire. In fact, if you look at this objectively, you would actually start worrying that this is an economy that looks like it is overheating, but not according to what you hear, of course, in the news. Uh, this is a uh, December headline, the New York Times. Good morning. Why do Americans say the economy is in rough shape? Because it is. I just showed you all the data. Unemployment rates are record low. You can't go down any street in the nation without seeing a help wanted sign. Home prices Going through the roof, there seems to be an insatiable appetite for housing at this point in time. How do we square it with this nonsense? The nonsense we continue to hear in the, the halls of power in Sacramento or in Washington, D.C., where they still talk about the recovery. Of course, in the press where it doesn't, you know, New York Times, it could be the Wall Street Journal, it could be the New York Post, the L.A. Times, the Sam, whatever. It's the same set of stories. And, of course, 
all these academic economists who sit in their offices dreaming up ways to try and panic people to think things are terrible, despite the fact, of course, the economy is absolutely red hot. Which brings me, of course, to the biggest point here. Beware the narrative. Look, what we think about the world, you know, economists don't like to acknowledge this, but, but there is the narrative and there is the reality. In the economist world of a rational human being, it, those are the same thing, because people are rational, ergo, people respond to what's going on in the economy, and the story therefore reflects reality. Now, any even remote study of human behavior suggests, of course, that the narrative can become incredibly off base, unchained, untethered to anything you might call an objective sense of reality. And that is exactly what this nation is going through and has been going through for over a decade. In the context of an otherwise incredibly healthy economy, 11 year expansion, everybody kept talking about a recession that was never gonna happen. And then the pandemic, of course, which truly did come out of left field, of course, spooked us into thinking it was the end of the world. It was a depression. I mean, it wasn't just the U camp. There was the W's and the square root signs. There was even some clown economists out there calling it the L-shaped recovery. We were going to hit bottom and never grow again. What is wrong with these people? Look outside, look at the parking lot of any local supermarket, any local store, and you'll see what I'm talking about. This economy is on fire. Look, there's no doubt that COVID has been a tragic natural disaster. There's the only way you can think about it. Millions of people have died. Millions of families, of course, are grieving. Uh, that is a natural disaster across the entire globe. But natural disasters, by their very nature, do not have long-run economic consequences. This was going to be a rapid economic recovery, no matter how tragic the underlying circumstances are. But that wasn't the narrative. All these economists who are telling us that the end is nigh and everything is terrible and everything is in decay and decline and about inequality, these folks have completely pushed the narrative to this populist nonsense, which is driving po po uh, politics across the United States, right here in the California. Uh, populist politics driven by a story of problems that don't exist. It's as simple as that. Well, that same narrative drove our policy authorities to overstimulate this economy at an insane level. We're talking $11 trillion in stimulus and counting. They haven't fully backed off the gas pedal. They continue to talk about, boy, is the economy recovered? Not only is it recovered, it is overheating. Now, yes, we have the situation in Ukraine, and, and we're all Ukrainians, and Putin's is, is a, a horrible human being, um, but that's a sideshow. It's nothing to do with anything except for to remind us that the one advantage we have in this time of, shall we say, excessive prosperity is we are the global reserve currency. Interesting times. Look, there's no doubt that things are on fire, but this is a sugar rush. At some point in time, the stimulus is going to have to be withdrawn, and we're going to be facing consequences for that. And they could be quite ugly. I don't know how this lands because there's too many policy choices in front of us being driven by a, a political narrative that is completely off days from reality. Now, the long of it is also a little kooky. Look, there are new, new normals coming out of this pandemic. The pandemics, epidemics have been with humanity since the dawn of time. There's nothing new here, right? But what happened over the last two years, we were all stuck inside, we were all staring at computer screens, and the, the wheels of social change were lubricated. And all these sort of changes were already taking place, but were being held back by just the basic resistance of human beings, suddenly snapped and all sorts of incredibly good, well, not necessarily good, but different things started to happen. All these long-run trends accelerated, and here we go. Now, by the way, what does this mean for the Inland Empire? What does it mean for real estate? Well, I'll tell you what. Real estate's got some bump in the roads ahead. There's no doubt about it. But at some level, in what could be very rocky seas, real estate could indeed be the safe haven. Um, as for the Inland Empire, from a long-run perspective, putting aside the big cycles in front of us, a lot of those long-run changes are broadly, of course, supportive of the Inland Empire economy. And there are exciting times ahead for this particular region. 
if again we can break away from the silly narrative of decline that somehow or other there's something wrong in our world when there's not. We shall see. So, a lot to talk about. I have too many slides as always. Uh, I know Lance will make a copy of these slides available, and of course you can always re-watch this uh, uh, video as the case may be, but let's just jump right in. Again, the U versus V debate. Um, you can see it's a V. Uh, what happened, of course, is we did have one of the deepest recessions we've ever seen in the United States. It was also the shortest. It was uh, about two months, two months beginning to end. Within two months, we were in recovery mode. We saw the most rapid recovery ever seen. And from a consumption standpoint, we're back to a long run trend. GDP, we're still a little bit behind. We're a little bit behind, not so much because there's any lack of demand, but because the way the economy has bounced back is in a different kind of way. For example, the incredible amount of spending on goods right now, durable goods, non-durable goods, way up. Residential investment, way up. Imports are way up. Well, these have hit supply chain capacities, which are holding consumption back. That's the only thing that's really going on. Why was this so different? Well, lots of different reasons. I, I think we've talked about this in past videos, but to go through it really quickly, this was a different kind of recession. The lessons of the past didn't apply this time. How was it different? Um, very simple. It was a supply shock, not a demand shock. The big thing, of course, in, in the Great Recession was this. In 2006, we felt rich. In 2008, we realized we weren't. Now, that decline in asset values, home values, the stock market, everything else, led to, of course, a situation where Americans had to start rebuilding their balance sheet. They had to rebuild their wealth. How do you do that? You spend less, you save. And therein, of course, lay the problem with the slow recovery after the Great Recession. Everybody was saving, so nobody was spending. Nobody was spending, so the economy wasn't growing very rapidly. Because the economy wasn't growing very rapidly, incomes weren't going up, and of course, because incomes weren't going up, people were having a tough time saving. Um, this held the economy back, but we eventually did overcome it. Now, this time, we didn't have a demand shock. There was no collapse in asset values, as I'm going to show you in a second. Quite the opposite, asset values have gone up like nobody's business. Now, what this means, of course, is um, this was a supply shock. Uh, what does that mean? Well, in 2010, people didn't go to restaurants because they couldn't afford to. In 2020, they didn't go to restaurants because they weren't allowed to. And being good Americans, they took their money and they spent it on damn well anything else that wasn't nailed down in the shop. Anybody who tried to buy a boat, a camper, a bicycle in 2020 knows exactly what I'm talking about. Everything that wasn't nailed down to the shop floor was sold. And the numbers are still amazing on the good side of the equation. This is overall spending relative to the long-run trend. And spending on durables and non-durables is still 5, 6, 7, 8% above long-run trend. At one point in time, durables was over 20% of the long-run trend. It's not just, of course, about the, the pattern of spending relative to, say, services, but even, of course, the distribution of economic activity. Right now, Stockton is seeing significantly more taxable sales receipts than San Francisco is. Kind of a crazy world. Uh, U.S. and production is, is struggling to keep up with demand. They can't. There's not enough trains, not enough trucks, not enough capacity. Uh, just take auto sales, for example. Easily, easily, last year they would have sold 2 million more cars if they had had the inventories available. But they didn't. A few years ago, they basically decided to get rid of inventories. Maybe they were believing all the pessimists about the recession that was going to happen any minute. And of course, they felt very smart at the beginning of the pandemic, thinking, oh, it's going to be a Great Depression. Aren't we smart for not having those inventories? And then, of course, now there is still basically no inventories of cars for sales in the United States right now. It's incredible. Industrial production has years just to try and catch up. And this goes back to these global supply problems we're seeing out there. And we can go into the ports and the, the trucks and all the other stuff going on. Look, does it matter? Absolutely not. Because this is a demand-driven economy. And where there is demand, there will be supply. Where there is a profit, there is a way. I'm not worried about producers. They will catch up. They will persevere through these problems of supply in order to eventually meet all this amazing, unsated American demand. Profits are up. Uh, business investment is way up. Well, where are the jobs? You know, it's interesting. Um, for all the good news here, we're still below 1.6 million jobs from where we are. You can see that on the graph labeled chart title. Apparently, I need to update that when I have the download to PD, uh, the PDF. Um, why aren't jobs back? Well, it's kind of a silly question to ask about 
payroll jobs? Why don't we, aren't we back? Because we know that there's plenty of demand for jobs. The JOLT data, 7% job openings rate in the United States right now, 7%. Prior to the pandemic, it was not even 5%. You can't go down any street in the United States right now and not see a help wanted sign. The unemployment rate is irrelevant at this point in time as an economic statistic. Number of payroll jobs, irrelevant. Now what happened here, of course? Well, this was coming. We've talked about it in the past. Um, the boomers, of course, were this incredible inflection point, all raised in families of 10 kids, all had one kids. The population pyramid turned into a population column. Now that boomers are retiring, lo and behold, there's not enough people coming in behind them, millennial and Gen Zs, to fill in the gaps. Coming into the pandemic, number of people from 15 to 64 in those prime working years was actually declining in the United States. We had a brewing labor shortage as it was. What happened during the pandemic? Three million people left the workforce. They just left. They got up, they left. Why? Most of them were probably on the edge of retirement anyway. But they were basically being begged by their boss to not do it yet, to not to stick around for another six months. I'll give you a little bonus. I need you. Um, and they did. And they stuck around. Pandemic hits. They're home. Suddenly they're realizing how nice it is to be at home. Uh, they just refied their house at 2.75%. And by the way, their 401k is up 20%. Screw it. Let's retire. And they did. En masse. Three million people left the labor force. And of course, now we're trying to rebuild the economy and there is no one to hire. And the sectors that got rid of the most people, a combination of food, arts and recreation, these are the sectors that have the biggest problems. Millions of job openings in, in hotels and food right now because they simply can't get enough people. And you can see it in the labor numbers. Look at this crazy numbers. This is just came from the Atlanta Fed. This is the wage tracker. Right now, 6.5% earnings growth for Americans, workers right now. And by the way, who's getting this? Believe it or not, the people in the bottom quartile are seeing the fastest pace of earnings increase right now. It is a crazy upside down world um, because of labor shortages. The solution, by the way, the labor market solution of wage inequality is here right now. That is to say, major labor tartness. And by the way, this takes traditional economic development and completely flips it on its head. I mean, in the old days, two years ago, um, well, what was it? It was jobs, jobs, jobs. You remember, right? It's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. We need jobs. Can we bring some more jobs? Well, look across the economy today. We have plenty of jobs. We have too many jobs. We have an oversupply of jobs. If anybody comes in and says, hey, I have more jobs for you, you go, well, that's nice. Uh, park them with the other ones over here, because I got no more space. Um, we don't need jobs. We have too many. We need workers. Ah, workers. It's no longer jobs, jobs, jobs. It is now workers, workers, workers. A completely different kind of conversation. Um, how do you expand the number of workers? Well, you want to expand your population, get people to move here, whether they're moving from L.A., from Nevada, from, I don't know, Canada, or perhaps the Philippines, wherever <coughs> they can move here. You can have more kids, too, uh, but that is an expensive and long-run way of increasing the overall supply. <coughs> you also have, of course, the intensive raising participation rates among your existing population. Now more than ever, we need pre-K education, right? I mean, before we used to call that a social policy. Oh, you're just worried about low-income families, or maybe we should be, maybe we shouldn't, whatever. Now you could say, hey, pre-K education, it's great for the family, it's great for the kid, and by the way, it's also great for your economy, because you are now able to have more of these women who would otherwise be home with their kids, able to continue to participate in the workforce, which, by the way, is good for the local labor market, good for the local economy. And then, of course, the productivity enhancements. A couple of years ago, remember a big economic stare story? Remember, oh, be afraid of AI. Be afraid of the robots. They're coming to take your job. Bring on the robots, folks. We desperately need them in this era of labor shortages. And then, of course, really, again, brings me to the conversation about who's recovering and who's not. We all have, folks. <laughs> I mean, yes. It's true. Uh, jobs in Arizona are above where they were pre-pandemic. In California, they're significantly below. That doesn't mean that Arizona has recovered and California hasn't, because job openings are up everywhere. 
again, unemployment's not a relevant statistic. The number of jobs is not a relevant statistic because we know there are an incredible amount of job openings everywhere. It's all about, well, what happened to your labor force? Did you see huge amounts of retirements? Did people move away? Well, here's the numbers. The Inland Empire, by the way, has done magnificent through this particular downturn. Uh, right now, as of January 2022, 28,000 jobs above where you were pre-pandemic. Again, not much of a growth rate, but unlike the rest of the world, there are more jobs here now than were pre-pandemic. And by the way, the labor force expanded and actually expanded, which is phenomenally good news for the local economy out here. Compa contrast that to L.A. L.A., down, by the way, is down about 162,000 payroll jobs. Now, mind you, there's plenty of op job opportunities out there. We know that. But, of course, the labor force itself is down 192,000. Whether they retired or left the area, there's no one to hire. So the Inland Empire, again, looks wonderful. And it really begins to, of course, boil down to that incredibly important source of economic development. Where are people moving and why are they moving there? And look, California continues to see a record share of people moving out of the state towards other parts of the United States. You throw in the domestic and the international numbers and it's a little more balanced. But clearly, we have to start asking a question, why are people moving out of the state? And of course, what about the Inland Empire? This too is a place that has basically been growing upon demographic growth. What is happening on that front? So, of course, we have the conversation about people leaving the state of California. It, of course, becomes a conversation about housing. Uh, so let's talk about the housing markets. We all remember the big collapse of housing. Didn't happen. Of course, sales took off. New home sales took off. Home prices up 20% year over year. You can see the numbers. Uh, for the last 15 months overall in the U.S., 24% growth and home prices relative to 5.7%. Uh, even here, for example, in California, Los Angeles, 23% overall, and crazy, crazy numbers. Uh, new housing permits are up strongly across the board as a case may be. Why? What happened? We were told housing was going to collapse, and instead it took off. Um, well, there's two things to this. One is a story about economic fundamentals, and the other one is, yet again, the story about uh, the narrative. You know, what's interesting is, of course, I made a name for myself back in 2006, being one of the guys on the West Coast who was talking about real estate bubbles and the potential impact on the economy of a collapsing real estate bubble. Um, now, back then, people had a weird idea. They said, hey, home prices can't fall. And honest to God, he said, well, what are you talking about? But that's, that was built into some of the models that the folks in Wall Street were using when they were valuing the subprime-backed securities. They actually were pretending that in this world, nominal home prices couldn't fall. Now, flash forward to 2019, because in 2019, it turns out that under certain conditions, mainly when all hell is breaking loose, foreclosures, massive excess supply, uh, complete collapse in credit markets, home prices can indeed fall. In 2019 now, um, I can't tell you how many times I had this happen to me. I would be in a presentation, and I would have someone walk up to me, and they would ask me this question. Hey, Chris, that was really interesting. Um, by the way, when are home prices going to fall? And that's the operative word, when. Not, not if, mind you, when. Now, in 2005, Wall Street said home prices can't fall. In 2019, people said when. Now, of course, the answer in 2019 was never, at least not any time in the near future, because the fundamentals in real estate are just fine. But people told a story. The story was a house, that housing market was about to have a crash. We all remember the folks in 2019 and the stories about how housing was in a collapse, housing was in a recession. But what's interesting is we all told ourselves housing was in a recession, thus housing was in a recession because everybody was sitting on the sideline waiting to buy a home. Well, you get into the pandemic, everybody's been waiting around for home prices to fall when, of course, they never did, they just slowed. Uh, suddenly, interest rates, which have gotten to 5%, suddenly plummet. Uh, suddenly your bank account is bursting with cash because of all the money the government's giving you and you're not spending. And people went out and they said, you know, well, maybe home prices are going to fall, but it hasn't happened yet and I'm stuck at home, so let's just go buy something. And they saw an open house in the paper and they went and they got in line with the other 277 families who had exactly that same idea that particular week to go look at that house. So we went from, of course, a, 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 a mental 
famine, which never existed, to one of the most incredible housing feasts we've ever seen, and the market is absolutely continues to explode. Two months supply of existing homes. The new home market is back and forth five to six months. It's, it's fine. It's where it should be. But the existing home market, two months supply, it's crazy. Is it a bubble? Um, kind of, but not in a housing bubble kind of way, which sounds like a weird thing to say. But I do think all asset markets are being excessively inflated by, of course, Federal Reserve policy. And yes, that includes housing. But housing is itself not in a bubble in as much as there is nothing fundamentally wrong with housing. Take, for example, the fundamentals in terms of debt to equity ratios, which have been falling for well over a decade. Um, they started at almost 120% in 2008 in the middle of the climb. And then, of course, since then, debt to equity ratios are now down to about 50%. Household equity is approaching $25 trillion in the United States. $25 trillion. I, we've never seen anything like this. Affordability, uh, California. In 2011, 40% of California homeowners were housing cost constrained, spent over a third of their household income paying for that house. Uh, by 2019, that had dropped, 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 declined to 28%. Uh, we all heard how expensive California housing had become. It was expensive for everybody except for the people buying it. Which brings me, of course, to the point that, that this is being driven by income and interest rates, not by what I would call unreasonable speculation. As for California, prices are up like crazy, but they're up like crazy everywhere. Indeed, California's ratio of home prices to the rest of the United States remains at about 80%, where we've been basically the last decade. Um, so nothing unusual here. Uh, mortgage markets are changing. The refi market is, of course, dying um, because interest rates are up. We know overall originations are coming down rapidly. But n outstanding mortgage is starting to grow. This is people, of course, buying homes, uh, taking cash out of the market. So more people taking money out of the market, less people flipping money right now. As for rental markets, well, almost like housing took off by the end of last year, rents suddenly jumped, asking rents went through the roof. Um, no sign of any of these evictions. I don't even talk about that. It's a, such a complete waste of time. This nonsense about evictions that were never going to happen. Instead, again, vacancy rates incredibly tight, very little inventory out there. And again, even from an affordability standpoint, take, for example, the Inland Empire, where back in 2010, about a third of renters were housing cost constrained. That was down to, it's still high, too high, probably at 34%, but it hadn't been climbing like crazy. So, again, decent numbers. If you wanted to say there's anything wrong in housing, you might talk about the good old housing P.E. ratio. This is nothing more than the median price of a house compared to, of course, the asking rent for a Class A apartment. And it does say housing is getting ahead of itself. But even if housing is getting ahead of itself, it doesn't mean housing prices are going to fall. Rather, we might just want wait for rents to catch up to re equilibrate these numbers. And to be clear, with the incredibly tight inventories across the state, it doesn't seem as if this is a market that's going to crash anytime in the near future. Indeed, California's biggest problem is a lack of housing units. Uh, we've only been building less than 120,000 per year. The Department of Finance forecast for people in their prime working years in California no growth for the next 20 years. No growth overall in the state for people 15 to 64 for 20 years. Why? Because we don't build housing. Now, the Inland Empire, of course, escaped a lot of the big retirement because of the younger workforce out here. Indeed, the labor force continues to grow. It has been a center, of course, of labor force growth in California and Southern California for decades. It is one of the most rapidly exciting, growing economies in the nation. Um, no, it is not this low-income backwash. Uh, it, it just makes me crazy. Remember, if you just control for the level of education, incomes in, in Riverside, San Bernardino, exactly the same in Orange County and L.A., you just spend a third less on housing. This place provides the best quality of life in Southern California. And by the way, that quality of life is now becoming available for fewer and fewer people because here, of course, housing supply over the last housing cycle has really stagnated. Very little being built out here compared to pre-pandemic. Um, really a shame. Huge opportunities. Now, it's not a shame in as much as California's economy, the London economy, can't grow without new housing. It can. There's a big shift going on. Basically, you have high-skilled folks moving in, and you have lower-skilled folks 
moving out to other parts of the United States. We're growing on the intensive margin. And if you don't believe me, here's an easy way of seeing it. This is the number of folks. This is upper income households in, in Southern California cities. Uh, this blue line is, is households making 110 to 150,000. In 2010, it was 300,000. It is now 450,000. Look at the over 150K. In 2011, 250K. In Southern California, by 2019, uh, that was over half a million. And yes, LA has a big increase. Orange County has a big increase. So does the Inland Empire. Look at the numbers in San Bernardino, Riverside, Rancho Cucamonga. High income households across the fence. There's a lack of housing in Southern California, and you have a constant movement of folks who are moving into this region, higher skilled folks replacing some of the lower skilled folks who are functionally having to move out of state because they don't have enough housing. But ultimately, from the point of view of the Inland Empire, this means a rapid increase in household income growth and, of course, more and more capacity to afford higher home prices. As for the non-residential side, uh, interesting story on office, a big mix. Of course, warehousing came out of this like crazy. You certainly saw this in Southern California. The numbers are nuts. The vacancy rates uh, are, have just absolutely collapsed. Uh, rent growth is through the roof. You can see the numbers right here. Uh, a couple of years ago, vacancy rates here were almost 15%. They've come down some crazy amount, depending on the number you've seen. Why? Well, again, what happened during the pandemic? We all started buying stuff from home. And yes, the e-commerce share of retail popped and is staying relatively high. But it's also brick and mortar, guys. Take a look at the numbers. This is data, um, Pitney Bowes U.S. package delivery. In 2018, there were 13.2 million packages shipped in the United States. In 2020, it was 20 million. 20 million packages delivered to people's homes. And what is it in 2022? 22 million, 23 million? There's a reason Amazon, UPS can't get enough space. Walmart can't get enough space. Everybody's having it delivered, even if it's from that bicker more store. It's a different game, and, and these warehouses are getting filled up. The interesting thing, of course, has to do with office space. Because office space vacancy are going up, but now there's an increase in rents. And for really high-end markets, you're suddenly seeing a scramble for high-end space. And what the heck? And to be clear, this all boils down to the work from home phenomenon. Work from home. According to Atlanta Fed, prior to the, the pandemic, about 10% of business office days were work from home. Afterwards, 30%, candidly, maybe 35%. I heard uh, a study in San Francisco where they expect that 30% of their office jobs maybe work from home, uh, moving ahead in the long run. And this is intriguing because, well, remember that downtowns exist for a reason, which is a strange thing to say. But all these businesses go downtown. It, by the way, downtowns are expensive to rent in, they're expensive to, to park in, to eat in, to drive to. They're a pain in the butt. Yet the majority of, of economic output growth in the United States over the last 30 years has occurred in these dense job zones. Why? Well, economists say there must be some external economies of scale, something offsetting the higher costs, whether um, it's uh, technology transfers or access to a liquid labor market or the panache of, of being in an urban setting. Now, what happens when suddenly everybody in that urban setting needs smaller amount of space because people aren't coming in that often? Well, suddenly there's a demand, decrease in demand for space. But in turn, companies are like going, well, hey, I want smaller space, but now I want that marquee location. So suddenly all these companies are looking at nice office space. And that's the stuff that's popping. That's what people want. They want to be in that nice space, smaller amount, nice space. Now, what does that mean for jobs? Well, that means there are going to be more jobs downtown, but fewer workers. Think about that. More jobs, fewer workers. What? Well, any one of those jobs in downtown LA, downtown Irvine, may not actually be inhabited by a body that day. 30% of those people are going to be working from home. Where's home? Depends. Are they going in once a week? Once a month? Twice a week? Twice a year? Now, it's a different kind of demand for space. Go back to the conversation of economic development. I want workers, 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 and I don't care where their job is. If they want to be here, and they're going to spend money here and time here and pay property taxes here, great. We don't need the job. We need the worker. 
And think of a place like the high desert, which inflated so horribly prior to the Great Recession, only the collapse. You think of Adelante, Apple Valley, Victorville. These were the places that were the center of that mess. Now these may be the places that will be the center of population growth. Because yes, it would be wonderful to live up there. What do you need? You need a good highway. We got that. You need a, a good school district. They got to work on that. You need some restaurants, some social life, nice neighborhoods with some playgrounds. But they have the capacity, they have the will. And now, if you only have to go to your job twice a week or once a month in Irvine, why not? What a great place to raise a family. So it's a different kind of game. Now, where does this all go wrong? Right? I mean, everything sounds great so far. Everything's great for the Inland Empire. Real estate's on fire. Not a bubble. Inland Empire, nothing but demand for, for homes and incomes are up. And Well, yeah, a lot of this prosperity is built on insane amount of public money. Insane amount. For every dollar in lost income, the $800 billion Americans lost over the course of this downturn, the federal government gave us back over two trillion dollars. There was a 2.6 to 1 replacement rate. That's not what Keynes was talking about. The man is spinning in his grave right now. This is not anything to do with economic stimulus. This is nothing more than buying an election. And you could certainly see a lot of that much money at the economy. By the way, money that people can't spend because they're stuck inside. 2.5 trillion excess savings, 3.5 trillion excess deposits. Wasn't just Congress, Mr. Powell's war. He came in, he rode to the rescue as well, pushed down the federal funds rate to zero. You always do that. And then, of course, he lobbed $4 trillion in quantitative easing. Quantitative easing, what's that? Well, that's nothing that we've actually used in the past until the latest, last, of course, big downturn. During the course of the Great Recession, we had an incredibly unique circumstance. Interest rates were near zero, which limits Fed policy. Um, ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, incredibly, incredibly bright scholars, um, pulled out the old rule book. What do you do if you can't lower interest rates? You go to quantitative easing. What is that? We're going to buy bonds from the system. Bank, and we're going to buy those bonds and give money directly to the banks. And this will put money into the economy to prevent the deflationary policies of the collapsing Financial markets, sheer genius, saved the U.S. economy from a meltdown. Now, Jerome Powell, not an economist, a, a lawyer, nothing wrong with that. Not that I'd want one putting a filling in my head or fixing my toilet. Um, but a lawyer, a politician, one might say, as most of the reserve board is, and he rolls into town and does $4 trillion in, quanti $4 trillion in quantitative easing. Not the three trillion, four trillion. He does it over lunch, not over five years. Why? Why? Uh, back then, we had a, a meltdown in the banking system. Record bank loans charts off. We had derivative markets in complete freefall. We didn't see the end of it. Today, the financial markets are rock solid. There's nothing wrong. Case Schiller index. Home prices were plummeting down almost 15 percent year over year. Everybody's. How do we rescue the housing market? The home prices are up 20%, Mr. Powell. What are you doing? How about bankruptcies and foreclosures that were at record high, not record lows? What are you doing? What are you doing? There's no reason. You, there's not a possible shred of evidence that we need this money. Outside, of course, of the ridiculous narrative being told by politicians, the press, and these cloistered academics who don't understand what the real world looks like. And what happens when you throw that much cash at the economy? In 2019, there were $100 billion of venture capital investments in the United States. 2021, $220 billion. Okay. I don't think there was a 110% increase in the number of good ideas between 2019 and 2021. Uh, the stock market, even with the sell-off, still is an incredibly high P-E ratio, second highest ever outside the recession, cap rates for every kind of real estate continue to fall. By the way, speaking of real estate transactions, did you see Q4 on the commercial real estate? This is Wells Fargo data. They had to rescale this graph to get the data to fit. It was crazy. Uh, Bitcoin, $43,000. Okay, millennials, to be clear, let me explain. It's a Ponzi scheme. 
P-O-N-Z-I. Please look it up, read about it. It's an Italian guy. He played this game in the past. It's the same damn thing. Uh, never mind. You go to your message boards and tell yourself your ridiculous fables. It'll catch up to you. My generation had Beanie Babies. You have Bitcoin. Yours is a lot more dangerous. In the meantime, what does it mean? Well, we're wealthy. Financial markets are on fire. An overall increase, $30 trillion in the last two years of new household net worth. Financial obligations ratio, never been lower than it is right now. We're incredibly rich, all on the basis of $11 trillion of federal and monetary spending. Simple as that. Hardly a surprise, debt markets are incredibly clean right now. Now again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. $5 trillion in debt in two years. Seven trillion, I'm sorry, 10 trillion in seven years. What are we doing? The fourth quarter of last year, we had a $1.6 trillion annualized budget deficit. $1.6 trillion, structural, structural. We came into it with Trump's trillion dollar, we're coming out of it with Biden's $1.6 trillion structural gap. This isn't sustainable. None of this is sustainable. Remember, boomers are retiring. There's gonna be huge increases in spending on Social Security and Medicare. And of course, when you put all the money in the economy, there's an incredible amount of demand. Everybody feels rich. They wanna buy everything. There's nothing to buy because the economy was never built for this amount of demand. And prices are going up. 7%, 8% right now overall core rates and 6%. The only thing that's crazy is that we continue to listen to this silly idea that inflation is just transitory. It's a supply chain problem. What inflation, right? Hear no inflation, see no inflation, speak no inflation. Don't worry about inflation, they say. Uh, well, this is my favorite tweet so far this year. Feds Bullard, the monetary and fiscal assistance provided in response to the pandemic may have been excessive. That's not my favorite tweet. That's obvious. It's the first, of course, comment. And no, that is not my handle, uh, but I couldn't agree any better. Absolutely, of course it is. Um, and you see the numbers. It's just crazy. Now, how far can it go? Well, look, when you have this much money being printed, you have to go back to the old rules. When inflation rates are old, the normal rules that link money supply to prices don't operate very cleanly. There's a lot of variable lags, Milton Friedman might say. But we're not in that regime. This guy came in and expanded the money supply in a way we have never, ever seen. This right here is what they call unit money supply. Um, and this is very instrumental. It's basically M2 divided by nominal GDP. And the reason I'm showing this to you is through the late 60s and 70s, that first big inflationary period, notice how the unit money supply, uh, supply stayed nice and constant. It isn't to say they weren't printing a lot of money. We had inflation back then because they were indeed printing a lot of cash, but prices kept right up with the money supply. Ergo, the unit money supply, money supply divided by nominal GDP, was nice and steady because of P was keeping up with money supply. Now, for years, we haven't lived in an inflation environment. I mean, I was a little, I'm an, I'm an old guy now. And when we had inflation in the 1970s, I was 10 years old. I didn't know what was going on. I was watching Good Times and, and, and I thought Saturday Night Fever was a cool movie. It was a different world. We're not used to this. Well, you better get, get used to it. Because the Federal Reserve has increased the money supply way up here. This has to re-equilibrate, and the only way it's going to do that is through a big jump in P. How much? A, a back of the envelope calculation says we have 20 to 30 percent more inflation in front of us, unless, of course, they don't start quantitative tightening, yanking the four trillion in quantitative easing out of the economy. Yes, 20 to 30 percent more inflation. Now, how fast does this come on? There's a lot of questions. Again, it's long and variable lags, that the pressures are there, and that's the key. So how does this shake out? Well, one of two things. Either the Fed does nothing, and interest rates will continue to go up as inflation continues to go up. And it'll be a slow, shall we say, suffocating kind of strangle, the way we saw in the late 70s. Or the Federal Reserve is going to choose the other tack 
hey, we got to get rid of this money. We got to do a quantitative easing, and then we'll get rid of that, which will quash prices in the short run, but it will send interest rates to the roof in the short run and slam the economy into a downturn. So they really have that option right now. So which way are they going to go? Are they going to cool it off before it gets too ugly? Well, here's what I've heard coming out of D.C. Why do we have inflation? First, it was supply chain issues. Then it was a federal deficit, greedy corporations. How about not enough manufacturing jobs in the United States? That came out of the State of Union address. Biden's great, bad green energy problems. Now it's Mr. Putin's fault. Yes, yes, Mr. Putin's fault. And next to it will be Saturn is in line with Jupiter. Disco's making a comeback. And, of course, it's the new host on Jeopardy. Look, when everybody in D.C. is making excuses for inflation when the real reason is very simple. We gave Americans too much money. Now they want to buy everything. There isn't enough of everything, and that is making prices going up to go up. That is what's happening in our economy today. And until you get rid of some of that cash and that demand, this doesn't go away. So there are issues with inflation. It becomes hard to figure out how to invest, how to save, how to uh, build for the future. We saw this in the late 70s. It's not a comfortable place to be, but we're not willing to have that conversation. Instead, we worry about energy prices. I'm sorry, oil prices will come back down. Does anybody else remember two years ago, it was negative $40 a barrel. Um, the United States will get lots of this stuff. Instead, you have to think about where are rates going. And again, they're going to go up. There can be no other direction for rates to go up. But how fast, how far, how fast do the bond markets respond? They're starting to. We know, of course, that mortgage rates are, are getting close to 5%. Again, still low from a long-run standpoint. But think about where they could go. The spreads, the 10-year, 2-year are starting to shrink. All signs that things are getting to shift. And this time we have an interesting dynamic because, remember, it's not just, unlike the 1970s where we had roughly a current account, kind of stable current account, this time we're incredibly reliant on the rest of the world. A 4% trade deficit right now. Where does the dollar go? Well, right now the dollar is nice and strong. Foreign investors are willing to give us money at a 2.5% interest rate or a 4% interest rate, whatever it happens to be the bond market is right now, even though we have an 8% inflation environment. They're doing so because they are worried about Mr. Putin. We are the global reserve currency, and they will give us money. So, yes, they can keep this going, but at some point in time, this has to turn off. It just does. And remember, we have a lot of debt. We're on the back end of not just an enormous accumulation in now public sector debt, but that was on top of the enormous accumulation in, in pu private sector debt in the run-up to the Great Recession. We are at 350% debt to GDP right now. Never been higher. Our real estate itself, I, look... If you look at affordability, real estate's still affordable once you account for interest rates. But if interest rates get to 7%, well, housing is no longer affordable. So by the way, what does that mean for residential markets? What does it mean for your buyers? It's not 2006. It's just not. Um, this is a long-run graph of 30-year fixed-rate mortgages. That's the red line. And the growth rate of median home prices. This is that long-run NAR data set. goes all the way back to 1970. And you saw what happened back there. I mean, look, this is the Great Recession, right? Mortgages were actually pretty low. They didn't really go up. But we saw, of course, a collapse in home prices because of the bad debt, because of the excess supply, because of all the problems in the market, not because of interest rates. It was a different kind of thing. Back in the 70s, when we had that big jump in interest rates, home prices just went flat. They didn't collapse. So this is the type of housing downturn that Wall Street was imagining at the beginning of, of course, the Great Recession in 2005. They said, home prices don't fall because in the past when we had a big shock, when interest rates went up, home prices didn't fall. They just went flat. While, of course, we eventually waited for the fundamentals to catch up. So... That is what's likely to happen right now. In what could be a very, very stormy path in front of us, real estate could end up being a safe haven. But again, where's the downside? Well, for your industry, it's all about, of course, sales. Um, and that is what took the big hit. Again, a giant increase in interest rates in that late 70s period. And of course, home sales absolutely collapsed. So back then, it was a liquidity decline, not a price decline. 
In 2006, it was a price and a liquidity decline. But that, again, was because of the fundamentals of the market, bad fundamental markets that are not in the housing market today. It is a different kind of real estate cycle, and one, again, candidly, where you could be on the upside. Even on the apartment side, it's not great. We know, of course, when interest rates start to go up, cap rates are going to follow, and it's going to look like you're going to take a big hit. But, you know, rents do kind of keep up. This is high inflation periods. This is rent to everything else prices. And rents get a little flat in the context of high inflation period. But again, you hang on to the other side of the high inflation, and rents start to come back again. So even there, it could be a bit of a safe haven as long as you have space, as long as you're not over leveraged. It's all about playing it safe. The scary part, of course, is not about housing and housing spending or even consumer spending. It's all about government. Because the really scary thing is the fact that we picked up $10 trillion of new debt. And remember, part of the government's budget is paying back interest on that outstanding debt. And that's the scary thing. You know, we picked up all that debt with no increase in the federal interest payment to GDP because the government free road on that giant decline in interest rates just like everybody else did. Well, what happens now? We go ahead. Again, one of two things. Inflation continues to creep up and bond rates keep up behind it, or quantitative tightening and bond rates go through the roof immediately. Higher interest rates in front of us, and that's going to cause a spike in spending on debt, on federal spending, on top of the $1.6 trillion structural deficit. You have a scary round of either high, higher taxes or rapidly slashing government spending. Again, when? I don't know. How much can the federal government borrow? How much can the reserve currency, still arguably the largest financial system in the world, how much can it borrow before the globe says not enough? I don't know. It's a trillion dollar question. It remains to be seen. But in the meantime, the economy's back. The V was the only logical outcome. It's exactly what happened. It's been hampered by the lack of demand, not by the lack of supply. Consumers are pushing inflation, not being heard of it, and global geopolitics are mainly a dangerous distraction. Labor supply shortages, good for low-skilled workers, reduces inequality. But you know, again, economic development is no longer jobs, jobs, jobs. It's workers, workers, workers. Immigration, programs to encourage senior and female employment, capital investments, it's a different game. As for the outlook, hot until it's not. Right? Look, the economy is on fire. Unemployment is 3.6%. I said unemployment might be 3.4% by the end of 2022. That's already wrong. It could be 3%. But inflation is going to continue to heat up. How does this break? Does the Fed just sit on it, continue with the silly excuses, let everything get hotter and hotter and hotter until, of course, then we have to acknowledge it and we have the big hit? Or do they, of course, take care of it right now? Quantitative tightening. Boom, spike the economy right now. We don't know. We just know there's a sugar crash out there. Uh, as for real estate, again, could be a safe haven. How does it go? We don't know. We just don't know. If I knew how this shook out, I'd have a boat bigger than Putin's. You can't know. It's how the Fed decides to move. It's what the White House decides to do. How do they handle this? What do the bond markets do? When do they flinch? Do they flinch? We don't know. Enormous questions, enormous degree of uncertainty. The longer this goes, the more painful it's going to be. But of course, right now, the economy is on fire. Real estate isn't going anywhere. The Inland Empire is doing fantastic. Go out, make money, but be smart and watch for those storm clouds. In the meantime, I anticipate I will be back here plenty of times with Lance and the crew to give you a sense of what's happening in the overall economy and, of course, real estate right here in the Inland Empire. Thank you very much. Again, UC Riverside, Center for Economic Forecasting and Development. Please find us online. You will find all this information and more, and more about what we at the Center do and can do for you and your community. Thanks again.